On behalf of the city of Burlington, I want to join Ken and welcome, to my mind, the most dynamic political person in this country to the city of Burlington and to the children's space here in Burlington, Vermont. The reason that we asked Reverend Jackson to come right here to this children's space and to talk a little bit about child care is that more than any other candidate for President of the United States of America, Jesse Jackson has a rational sense of priorities. And he understands that putting money and giving help to the little children of this country and to child care workers and to working parents who want to make sure that their kids are going to have affordable child care is the direction that this nation has to go rather than giving tax breaks to corporations and spending hundreds of billions of dollars on a military, much of it supporting right-wing dictatorships. It is a great pleasure, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome to the city of Burlington a man who I sincerely believe, if we do our job right, can become the next president of the United States, Jesse Jackson. Let me express my thanks and delight to be with the mayor of the city, to be with a cross-section of friends from the state who support our campaign. We, by design, intentionally chose to come here to the child care center, to the day care center, challenge competitors, challenge the media, to put the focus on our real national and future security. I visit about four high school or elementary schools every week, right during the course of our campaign, because our children must not be reduced to a cliche. They are our future. They are our right now. And how we relate to them right now will determine security for our future. I remember in 1957, the Russians launched Sputnik. There was a sense of national insecurity. We had been outdistanced in space. What did we do immediately? We created a tremendous commitment to scientific research and investment, and we called it the National Defense Act, the Educational Defense Act. And once we put it in military language, only our youth could save us. And as a result, we invested more scholarships for scientific study. We raised pay for teachers. We offered incentive for teachers to go back to summer school or go to graduate school when we were most threatened by a leap in scientific technology by the, by the Russians, we immediately used education as our number one line of defense. It remains that even this day, prenatal care, Head Start, daycare, represent the foundation of our nation. We are right now victimized by the notion that we have security by having more missiles in Europe. That's false security. Our security lies within the developed minds and characters of, of our children. Head Start and daycare on the front side of life are more cost efficient than jail care and welfare and then the spare on the back side. Four years of interstate university in America for four years. Full academic scholarship, cost less than $30,000. Those same four years, full penitentiary scholarship, will cost $120,000 to $160,000. Schools at their worst are better than jails at their best. We should invest in teachers and children in their formative years, as opposed to jail warden and prisoners in their latter years. So this is the right priority, morally, right priority economically, it represents the first line of an authentic and serious defense. We must, in our budget priorities, shift from the false security 
of unnecessary missile systems far beyond our needs, began to invest in our children. Lastly, we measure the character of our nation by how we treat our children. I just left Alabama to come here today. All the focus on the New South, new social relationships, athletes playing ball together, students going to school together, half of all the nation's poor children live in one region. Highest infant mortality in one region. While we talk about defense against the Russian bear, what about defense against the tapeworm to eat up the bodies of our children? So it is good to be here today. I challenge my competitors. <clears throat> I challenge the media to put renewed focus on the youth of our country. In going to these schools, I ask our youth usually, Mr. Mayor, four basic questions. How many of you know someone in your age group who's dead because of drugs? Usually, about 25% stand. New Hampshire, Iowa, New York, Illinois, California, across the board. I then ask if you know someone in your age group who's in jail because of drugs. About 40% stand. I then ask if you know someone in your school who has tried drugs. Almost all of them stand. And then I ask if you know someone in your age group who has contemplated suicide. Usually about 60% of our children stand. These are our children who fear that they cannot cope. And thus they resort to drugs as anesthesia for their pain. Or sex without love, making unhealthy and unwanted babies, instant gratification, a sense of, of their power that results in short-term pleasure but long-term pain. Our children deserve our attention. When they are inclined toward drug use as anesthesia, and sex without love, short-term gratification without counting the cost, they are avoiding something. What are they avoiding? A future without family farms. A future without good jobs. A future with, with, with a poison environment. A future where they fear the threat of nuclear war. In the real sense, our children are measuring sticks for us. Their fears are real. Their response, the challenge is real. We who are adults must relieve them of their fears and free them up and assure them of a world without hazardous waste, without the fear of nuclear war, a world with jobs and farms and real security. Thank you very much. Mr. Jackson, Mr. President, would you like to see Mayor Sanders in the Congress helping you get the job done? <laughs> well, the role he will play is a personal judgment. I want him to remain in public service because we need him in public service. We need leaders in public service who have a sense of conscience and a sense of, of right priorities. And how we treat our children in the dawn of life. And how we treat the poor in the pit of life. How we treat old people or seniors in the golden years of their lives. And yes, how we treat strangers, as it were, who are abandoned. The mention of our character. The mayor's emphasis represents real strong characters in the best interest of our nation. Reverend Jackson, you spoke about the, the immediate concerns and the future being our children. In Vermont, the immediate concerns are, are the environment and, and our family farm. Under a Jackson presidency, what will Vermont I, I, Let me just add, if I might, that the concern of Vermont is, is also our children. It is also daycare. We've Yay. also learned that we have one of the highest infant mortality rates in this country. So I think... Well, farmers have children. And those children who grow up farmless and then homeless and then without insurance, those children cannot fully develop. So children on the farm need attention and health care and transportation and education. Secondly, we need to have a a commitment to agriculture to support family farmers as opposed to the big four grain monopolists. Commitment to fair prices. Farmers want parity, not charity. They work, they're simply want to get paid for working. Dairy people simply want fair prices and they deserve it. We should not play off the rural uh, dairyman or the rural farmer against the urban consumer when a, a carton of milk goes up or a box of wheat is 
price goes up. It's not the rural dairyman or farmer gouging the, the urban consumer. It's the monopolies in between. It's the barracudas eating up the small fish. Rather, this prices are driven down to drive dairymen and farmers out of business. We must protect the integrity of family farmers and dairymen. I support fair prices. I support supply management for family farmers. I support the return of their land. We can bail out Chrysler, we can bail out Europe, and bail out Japan. We can bail out family farmers in this country. We've lost 650,000 family farmers in the last seven years. It doesn't make sense to lose that many farmers while importing food from abroad, subsidized by the U.S. government for the sake of subsidizing the big four grain companies and pauperizing family farmers. Are you saying we leave by New Hampshire next week and then Vermont the week after that? Well, uh, I have a, a very measured response in this campaign, state by state, because it's not a one state 30 yard dash and look at the score for me. It's a 50 state, 50 league, 50 game season. Uh, the media played hours as if it were the Super Bowl. It was simply the opening game of a 50 game season. Game two, New Hampshire. And then there are 48 more games to go. The winner will be determined by the one who has the clearest message that can survive the long haul. The race does not go to the swift, the strong, or the moneyed, but those who hold out. I've run this race, I know how to hold out. Whoever gets the most popular votes, corresponding with delegates, will win in Atlanta. I intend to get those votes. Uh, one might observe that in the race in an hour that caucus, Gephardt, Simon, <coughs> Babbitt, spent $750,000 plus dollars, plus in kind. I spent $175,000. They had 300 staff members, I had 40. We still got double digits. The most cost-efficient campaign in Iowa. We registered 4,000 new Iowa voters. We left more of a lasting impact upon that state for the Democratic Party. Clearly, our message won. The difference really was, was money, not message. Other candidates are now responding to my challenge on multinational corporations. They should stop taking jobs out of this country pay their fair share of taxes, and reinvest in America. The party Jackson, rules just as bad at this time as they were before. You got luck. You didn't get what you would have gotten. Well, I hold out for the principle of one person, one vote. The last time around, uh, I received 400 fewer delegates than my popular vote called for. I want the popular vote to correspond with the delegates. If that happens, we're going to win the election in Atlanta. What was impressive in Atlanta was how basic rural farmers, teamster truck drivers, seniors, and high school and college youth, rural and urban came together to form a dynamic coalition. That coalition will continue to grow beyond our. We Reverend take a stand Jack against those who create the acid rain here To be sure, not only those who create acid rain, but those who exhaust our soil and who pour us now underground water. We have an obligation to clean up our environment, choose recycling over incineration, know that cleaning up our environment is health uh, intensive and job intensive. Not only are we healthier people, but we create thousands of jobs with commitment to clean up our environment. Reverend Jackson, you're being treated um, almost as someone at the back of the pack after Iowa and at the end think this is uh, justified? It certainly is unfair. If any other candidate in the race in Iowa had my record of support across the country, they would put Iowa and New Hampshire in perspective. I'm leading in New York, in California, Maryland, Virginia, North, South Carolina, Arkansas, Alabama, Louisiana. So I have the most viable campaign of anybody running. Others of them expect money, media, light, lightning, and luck to get them from Iowa to New Hampshire and hopefully they'll then be imposed on the nation by the media. The media should not assume the responsibility of eliminating candidates. The people should make that judgment. There is enough room in the lenses of the, of the cameras for all those who choose to run and get any measure of support.
Reverend Jackson, the question has always been asked, is Jesse Jackson ready to leave the country? Do you think the country is ready for Jesse Jackson? The country is ready for a multinational policy. It will shift the priorities from merging corporations and purging workers to reinvest in America. That's the message of the one in Iowa. The country is ready for a leadership. to put focus on our children in their formative years and choose head start and daycare over jail care and welfare. The country is ready for a leader who will pull people together, rural and urban, across lines of race and sex and religion and find common ground. The country is ready for someone who will stop drugs from coming into our country, who will stop jobs from going out, will secure family farms and stabilize our families and clean up our environment. The country surely is ready for a leader who has experience in foreign policy. My experience in foreign policy is more substantial than my competitors. I've been to Central America, met with its leaders, and Southern Africa, and the Middle East, and Europe. So I have a sense that if we use basic principles and consistent principles of supporting international law, self-determination, human rights, economic development, we'll have peace in Central America, peace in the Middle East, and freedom in South Africa. I represent and advocate the direction that will make our nation stronger and better. Thank you. Last question. What would be the Jackson administration My proposal for peace in, in the Middle East, A, we should reconvene Camp David as a frame of reference. This time, Israelis and Palestinians should be at the table. What we should do for, for Israelis and Palestinians, but neither can do for the other. Offer mutual security in exchange for mutual recognition. Right now, neither can offer the other that security because both are trapped in death grip. They're now on a, on a path of mutual destruction, mutual annihilation, and are too gripped by fear and even hatred to get a loose from that. We must offer a mediation role that's in their interest our interests and rural interests and pry them loose, offer them mutual security in exchange for mutual recognition. The present formula simply will not work. Occupation is, is too great a burden to bear. It gives Israel false security, the Palestinians no security, America stands haplessly by unable to relate in the crisis. Occupation, politically, it's divisive, it's tearing the country apart. Economically, it's too costly. Emotionally, it is too draining. Militarily, it is too bloody. We must offer a direct leadership. We should not hide behind Hussein or his or our history. We should deal directly and offer both of them mutual security in exchange for mutual recognition. That would be my approach. What's your reaction to the American reaction? I'm delighted. I'm impressed. You want to return I, the favor I, I, to him? And, and, and I hope that, that his endorsement will, will spread. <laughs> As you can see, this man needs no introduction. As you can see, this man needs no introduction. <laughs> but next, I'd like to introduce Ellen Friedman David of the Democratic Committee.
she just got my name a little bit backwards. My name is Ellen David Friedman. I'm going to be real brief because you've been waiting. <clears throat> I've had the uh, privilege of working uh, with and for Reverend Jackson for the last uh, four or five years. Whenever it was, someone called me up about six months before the uh, primaries in Vermont, the last time around, and they said, would you like to work on the presidential campaign of uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson? And I thought at first it was a trick call or a trick question. And I'll tell you in just one sentence why I thought that. When I was the age of most of you people here, when I was in college, we were doing everything we thought we could to change the world, to end the war in Vietnam, to fight against racism, to fight against sexism, to deal with what we saw as corrupt military industrial complex. And we marched in the streets and we held demonstrations and we occupied buildings. And the one thing we never considered doing was trying to elect somebody as president who was principled, who was anti-racist, who was anti-sexist, who was anti-imperialist, who would end the war we were involved in in Vietnam. We never thought of that as a possibility. The reason we didn't is because nobody then was running who represented that. And it has been a great privilege to work ever since that time for the Reverend Jackson, who absolutely stands for those things, who fights for those things every day, whether or not he is president, whether or not he's a presidential candidate. It's a tremendous honor and it's a challenge to us all to support him. I'm going to turn over this stage now to Mayor Bernard Sanders who just spoke outside and whipped the crowd into a frenzy there, as I'm sure he will whip you into a frenzy. He is likewise a candidate of courage, of principle, who obviously stands for the rights of the people who've been locked out of the system. He is the perfect person to introduce Reverend Jackson to you. Bernie Sanders. Thank you. Fellow Vermonters, today is a very exciting day for the city of Burlington and for the state of Vermont. And I'm going to tell you why, and I'm going to tell you why very seriously. The fact of the matter is, is that history is being made in the United States right now by a candidate who is running for president of the United States who, as Ellen indicated, is attempting to do something that has never before been done in the modern history of the United States. This candidate is attempting to put together a coalition, a rainbow coalition, a coalition of black workers and white workers and Hispanics and Orientals, a coalition of young people who want the right to get a higher education without having to bankrupt their families, of elderly people who want and are entitled to decent social security benefits, decent health care benefits, a coalition of farmers who all over America today are being thrown off of their land, of environmentalists who are wondering why we're destroying our forests with acid rain while we're depleting the, the ozone layer, while we're seeing nuclear power proliferating. Today, history is being made because a candidate for president of the United States is saying, people of America, working people, young people, old people, stand up and fight for your rights, and let's take this country back from the millionaires and corporations who dominate it. My friends, 50% of the American people, including many young people your age, have essentially given up on the political process. They said, why should I vote? Doesn't make a difference who's elected. One candidate wins, one candidate loses. Doesn't matter, nothing happens to me. Poor people all over this country don't vote. The candidate that I'm gonna introduce has done something unique. He has gone out into the streets and into the farmland and into the ghettos of this country, and he has brought people in to register to vote. <laughs> the
The last word I want to say, and I hope people understand correctly what I'm going to say and why I say that, why I'm saying what I'm going to say, and that is, as some of you may know, for better or for, reason, re, or for worse or for historical reasons, the state of Vermont happens to be the whitest state in the United States of America. That happens to be the demographic fact. Now, why is that important in terms of this election? And why is it important in terms of what happens on March 1st? I'm going to tell you why. The great political geniuses and the political scientists and the media, they have decided that our candidate can't become the president of the United States because they believe that white people are not going to support him. They say, yeah, he's doing well among black people, but white people, no, we're not ready for a black president. The fact of the matter is that if Jesse Jackson can carry Vermont on March 1st, and I think he can, if he can carry this state, which is a white state, the message will go out all over the United States that this man is going to become the next president of the United States. Ladies and gentlemen, fellow Vermonters, let us welcome to the state of Vermont the next president of the United States, Jesse Jackson. Okay.